Welcome to the Public Voice Salon. We are an open dialogue on culture and ideas with a particular focus on education. So we talk on our show about education, the arts, and social change, and how they all sort of inter intertwine and connect. And with that in mind, we are so delighted to have today on our show a person who I've wanted to interview or dialogue with for a long time, Dr. Leon Botstein at Bard University. He's the president, distinguished president of Bard College. Uh, he is also a classical music conductor, and he really is an upholder of the classical humanistic tradition in education. We talk a lot about on our show about the liberal arts and how that needs to be maintained, and about the problems in American education, about the connection between democracy and education, which is especially important now considering what happened a year ago at our nation's capital with democ democracy under threat. Okay, So uh, that's why it's so important that we feel that uh, people like Dr. Botstein get a, as broad an audience as possible. And I do recall, uh, Dr. Botstein, the first time learning about you was years ago uh, when I was teaching at a high school. And it was a very troubled, sort of a dysfunctional high school that I was in. It was very rigid and very authoritarian. I was trying my best to teach under the radar, right? And uh, then all of a sudden, I opened the New York Times one day, and I see Leon Botstein says high schools should be abolished. High schools as we know them should be abolished. And I said, wow, this is my guy. This is my guy. So anyway, with that introduction, Dr. Botstein, what is your take on the connection between democracy and education, and how, what grade would you give the American educational system today in terms of helping preserve our democracy? So thank you for having me. And um, <clears throat> I, um, let me start with the end of the question, your question. You would have to give America a failing grade uh, because of the character of our democracy. So consider the paradox. Uh, no one would agree that we have a functional government. You know, we have uh, ideologues, uh, uh, theater in, instead of politics. Uh, we have people who are more interested in their social media. We have gerrymandered districts. We have voter suppression. We have uh, people who are playing to the gallery, but the gallery now is not in a theater, but on social media. And we have people who um, are cynical and interested just in power and their own position. We elected uh, a person as president of the United States who is um, a mendacious fool and a dangerous man, a clown and a bully. Um, I don't, it's not a matter of that person's beliefs. And we have millions of Americans, our fellow citizens, who don't believe in the truth, don't believe in evidence. You can't convince them uh, uh, that, let's say, the election was won. You can't convince them that, um, the facts as best we know them about how vaccination works or what does vaccination do. Um, they can't distinguish between different probabilities. Are we better off if we get vaccinated or better off if we're not vaccinated in terms of the number of people who might die or get seriously ill? It's not a foolproof, there is no foolproof strategy. But they are unable uh, to also identify what it is that their rights are and what the laws uh, permit them to do. Um, they wouldn't be able to tell you very much about the Constitution or about our legal system. They believe in conspiracy theories of various kinds. And they look at people like myself as um, different from them uh, and um, privileged liberal people who are obviously going to fool them and uh, uh, we're living in our own bubble, uh, and we can't find a way to communicate. So we have a dysfunctional uh, political system. Um, not enough people come out to vote, and then we pass laws to make voting impossible. We create safe districts in which a contest isn't really possible. We have a primary system in which a small minority can hold 
uh, an entire district hostage and force people out of office because they know they'll lose a primary, which a very small number of people vote. So <clears throat> we have school board elections in local districts are held on odd times when nobody comes out. A very low level of civic participation. Yet the population has spent more time in school than any previous generation. There are more degrees held by more people. And as they give more degrees, the quality of our political life goes <laughs> down. So how can we give us ourselves a good grade? Can't give ourselves a good grade. And, um, you know, teaching has never been in the United States a truly valued profession by the public. No, public think that teachers don't work. You know, they resent teachers' unions because, um, why should they have a union? You know, they're not doing anything anyway. Well, it's just total nonsense. And in terms of a, a profession like law or teaching or medicine, comparatively, teaching is very poorly compensated for the importance of what it does. Um, and so it doesn't, historically, hasn't drawn um, uh, necessarily the, the best of our young people who go to college. So, I mean, there are many things wrong, and the government has the right conservative view is, is right on this front. They, they have wildly over-regulated and standardized uh, the school systems. And it's very hard um, to, to try to deliver excellence in a, in a public school system. But we have to do it. Uh, and uh, I think excellence and equity are reconcilable. They're not at odds. Now, I don't think, you know, reaching a population that has been discriminated, whether by race or by economics, giving them an excellent education is the best antidote. So I still think education is the most powerful instrument in creating a democracy. We're just not doing it. And I'm proud that um, you talk about being a high school teacher and reading something that I, I wrote about abolishing high school. Well, writing such a thing is easy, but the thing we're proudest of is we have eight public high school early colleges, six, um, seven of which are in six major cities, two in New York, one in Newark, one in Cleveland, one in Baltimore, one in Washington, um, and one in New Orleans. These are public high schools in which people in the inner city, young people can go, um, they go to 9, 10, 11, and 12. At the end of the 12th grade, they finish two years of college. They get for tuition free a public high school diploma plus a two year AA degree from us. Hmm. Bar. Hmm. And I so just, we show it can be done. I want to clarify to our audience, uh, Dr. Botstein, that you know, this is Bard College. Bard College has its own high schools that it has. has uh, They're public high schools. Right. Public okay. Tuition free, yes. Okay. That lead to a two year college degree. Mm -hmm. Tuition free. I see. I see. Let's think about when you think about American education, right? Now, I just saw, we just saw the other night on Channel 13, the new Ken Burns documentary on Benjamin Franklin, which was like, you know, must see TV for us. Like, you know, see one of the founding fathers, one of the heroes of the Enlightenment, you know, uh, another great hero of the Enlightenment was Thomas Jefferson. You know, and he always, I think, believed in the civic function of education, you know, this link between education and democracy. And you see that goes right through the 19th century when this idea of a, of a, of a classical liberal arts education had to do with studying literature, philosophy, and history, okay? That was the core, okay? Uh, you had Matthew Arnold, who talked about the best that has been spoken and written. All right, in the sweetness and light. He, I love the phrase, he, he talked about sweetness and light, you know. When I look around at our democracy today and I look at everybody at each other's throats, I say, hey, we need some sweetness and light here, you know. Let's bring the humanities back. And, um, and then, of course, you had John Dewey, whose first book in 1916 was called Democracy and Education, right? Given all that, you look at the past 30 years, and it seems like the entire function of education has been reduced to producing workers, right? We're going we're gonna to create a market economy. We're going to train people to be good corporate workers, and that, that's it. There's nothing more inspiring. 
And if you look at the ads for colleges, you know, it all reflects that, you know, how much money you're going to make, how successful you're going to be. Is it possible, Dr. Botstein, to transform that, especially during a crisis in democracy? I mean, there was, we had with the Sputnik crisis back in 57, when the Russians got to the satellite up there before us, and it was this crisis in education, math and science, math and science. Now we see we have a crisis in democracy. What can be done now to, to, to make a, a sort of a mass support for a civic-based education system? Do you think it's happening already? Do you see signs of that? Or? Well, I, I, no, I would say that I, you know, it would be nice if, if it all happened uh, spontaneously, but I don't think so. Let's go back to your idea that what we're doing is creating people who can function in the workplace. I'm not sure we're doing such a good job of that either. Um, you know, when we talk about the immigration crisis in the United States and people are against immigration, they don't realize that um, the high tech industry and the, the drivers of the economy are desperate for workers who are, have particular skills. So we are producing people, let's say with a high school diploma, whose capacity to do a sophisticated work in a modern economy is very limited very limited. And I happen to think science is a liberal art, and if it's taught properly, helps people to think and think independently. And, um, and so um, what we've done with science education is we've, uh, uh, we've sort of killed it. The most natural thing in a child, as you know, is curiosity about the natural world. Why does it snow? Why does it rain? Why does it appear as if the sun is going down, but we're actually moving? I mean, people are interested in why the leaves fall and then grow back and are green, right? Now, it, to be interested in Thomas Jefferson and Toni Morrison requires an education, right? But it doesn't require an education to worry about why the apple grows on the tree, right? So we've sort of destroyed the potential of good science and math education in young people. And we're not doing a good job on the corporate economic side either. I would say, um, and I am, I, you know, I love it when people realize that a good education, the kind you're describing, is very practical. People with educations, the kind of which you're describing, have the most stable and best incomes in the economy. Ooh. So there's no conflict between, you know, we call the arts, I mean, people say, we'll make fun of it, say, what can you do with art history, with literature? You know, my child's wasting their time in college doing this. No, not at all. Um, uh, in a particular market economy, um, being different, having a new idea, being competitive is partly a function of thinking for yourself. And if you can do it and you can be inventive, Ben Franklin, invent a stove, you know, mm -hmm. uh, you know, if you, if you can do that kind of thing, um, uh, you'll be more competitive than the person who's following the rules they were taught in school. Um, and so uh, there's no conflict between the usefulness mm. of an education and its civic power. Mm. We're just not doing a good job in, in inspiring both curiosity, um, habits of mind, um, uh, a kind of um, uh, a love of learning and a, and and a real curiosity about how our society does function, could function, and ought to function. So um, I would say it's not because our problems are not because we've made the education more useful or more economically competitive. Uh, we have problems because. Um, Learning is a long-term investment. It's not immediate gratification. You know, we, we, we forget that um, if I want to buy an ice cream cone, I'm going to buy it quickly, and I'm going to eat it quickly, and I'm going to like it, right? Mm. But you're telling uh, the what's wrong with our educational system is it, is it requires a kind of long view and an a patience that most adults don't possess. We're telling a kid in the fourth grade, what you're learning now, you know, you can't go out in the street and use, but if you keep on the track and keep on the steady, 12 years from now, you're going to hit a bonanza. 
Well, nobody, nobody waits 12 years to make money. They invest and take their money out as soon as they can, and they're expecting a return within a year or two years. So we haven't figured out um, how to uh, inspire young people to pursue an education. One of my, my um, contentions is that we stretch it out too long march too long and we don't do it well and we don't use time well and um in fact it would be much more effective if we could show people in middle school and high school how important education is to the things they want to they want to have money good careers they want to have good lives they want to have happy families they, the various dreams they have in the 21st century the ticket between their dreams and the reality is education. Yeah, gone are the unskilled labor jobs that are truly interesting. Mm. Gone is inventing the way Thomas Edison invented, without computation, without machines, without knowledge of data science. You're not going to do that. So the do-it-yourself uh, entrepreneurial uh, possibilities are more limited. And the knowledge-based opportunities are expanding. Green school is ever more important. But you're most interested, and I think you're right. I think you're absolutely right. Much more terrifying is the imminent collapse of democracy. Autocracy is winning. Uniformity, suppression of freedom, uh, that's winning. It's winning in Russia. It's winning in, in Hungary. It's winning in China. It might win in France. It, it, uh, it got very close to victory in the United States. And we may be coming around the bend for a second round of this. Um, where um, people have a government that um, really um, is not based on rights. It's not based on disagreement and diversity. It's not based on compromise. It's not based on um, real respect for people who are not totally alike. You know, um, I mean, I, I'm not a lawyer and I'm no judge of Supreme Court justices, right? And um, <clears throat> you know, I couldn't really tell one from the next. It's not, you know, not my, my field of expertise, but I can certainly uh, be taken aback by the way um, uh, Justice Jackson was handled in, I was embarrassed for the country, for my own fellow Americans, that it could see so blatantly appealing to prejudice and to stereotypes. And um, I was roundly criticized, but I, I, I interpreted the election of Donald Trump in 2016. Um, somebody at Time Magazine asked me to, uh, you know, to write about it, and I, I argue that um, people elected Barack Obama because it was a terrible financial crisis, and he clearly was more qualified, a better bet. But it was one thing to elect a president who was black. It was much harder to respect and honor a president who was black. And um, I, I very much side with the point of view that Nelson Mandela had. We're all prejudiced. We all possess prejudices of various kinds. It's, it's, it's one of the fundamental tenets of a Christian view of human beings as being flawed, imperfect. We're all imperfect. The issue is not to punish our neighbors for their imperfection, but to improve it, to get rid of the imperfection, um, to um, not harden those differences, and to find paths for reconciliation and cooperation. And we're not doing that. Well, I'm going to sort of take this into an interesting segue here and, and just introduce my wife, Claudia. Say hi, my darling wife, Claudia, who's my co-producer. Hi, Dr. Bassin. And she's from uh, Colombia, Bogota, Colombia. 
And because of Claudia, I actually read Gabriel Garcia Marquez's Hundred Years of Solitude. Right. Uh, all right. Uh, here is uh, uh, one of my favorite novels by Leo Tolstoy called Resurrection. Most people, oh, have, most people have never heard of it because they all know about War and Peace and Anna Karenina, but this was actually his most radical book, and it's about love and social justice. And uh, it's, it's an incredible read. It, it's a late novel, as you know, and, but it's also, um, it is, um, he was a kind of radical Christian, and uh, he had a radical, um, I would say, um, a different kind of revision of Christianity that uh, sort of has some fundamentalist aspects to it, but it, it was um, certainly in opposition to the organized church, and he was an idealist. I mean, he, um, he understood that in the Gospels um, was a vision of a world that wasn't a market economy with a lot of rich people and poor people. It was closer to communism than anything else. And um, so he, had, he was a wildly influential uh, uh, figure. And The Resurrection is the novel that, as you say, has the most radical Tolstoyan view. Did you know that it was the basis of a 1912 film? No, I've never known that it was a film at all. It was. It was, it was lost. But because it was lost, it was forgotten. Um, and because this movie came three years before Birth of a Nation, people still believe that The Birth of a Nation, which was a horribly racist film that came out in 1915, was the first American feature film. But it's not true because the film based on Tolstoy came three years earlier, and that was produced by Adolf Zucker, and that was who was the founder of Paramount. This was his first production, okay, and it was starring one of my ancestors. Oh, good for you! An actress named Blanche Walsh, who is a great forgotten actress, and I'm on a campaign to educate the world about her in time for her 150th birthday, which is next year. Well, congratulations! I, I think that's great. I recently had to watch Birth of a Nation because um, one interesting fact about Birth of a Nation is that uh, Griffith, the uh, director, um, insisted on using the um, music from The Ride of the Valkyries by Wagner to accompany the Ku Klux Klan uh, attack um, in the attempt to rescue Lillian Gish you mm. know, at the end of the film. And um, and I was I had to do a, a chapter for a book on Wagner where uh, it was about Wagner in America, and um, so I started with uh, describing the function of this music in the film, um, and so I actually had to uh, look at the film. Um, and um, as you know, the silent films always had musical accompaniment; they were never really silent films or silent in terms of the film, the music, the sound didn't come from the film stage or the film screen, excuse me. And, and there, were, there, were no, there was no audible dialogue, but there was a piano player or an orchestra. In the big European capitals, there were large film palaces with orchestra pits that played music while the film was being seen. So in this case, um, Wagner was used as kind of a soundtrack for this um, Kluka clan raid. Mm. Um, that's interesting. Um, uh, I, I don't know much about film history. I mean, I, I, Birth of a Nation is famous for, um, for it as a document of the extent of American segregation and race laws and attitudes. People don't know that Hitler was a great admirer of the Jim Crow laws, and it was an inspiration for his um, his Nuremberg laws, and uh, which is sort of discriminated against uh, Jews, and um, uh, also the uh, so-called uh, laws against the Chinese immigration that America passed mm -hmm. in the late 19th century. Um, so, you know, we have, as every country, every nation has, um, our low points and high points, and um, that we come to terms with them is an important thing. But the way we're doing it now is, um, is divisive in a way that's not constructive. 
You know, I want to say before I go any further that I love your bow tie. I just love the pink. <laughs> Uh, and uh, I love your background too. I love your bow tie and your background. The bow tie, the bow tie is made <laughs> by my daughter's mother-in-law. Ah, oh, okay. <laughs> she had made the most beautiful bow ties in oh. the uh, Camilla Smith, the most fantastic bow ties that were sold in various boutique places. I didn't know about them. And she was still making them. She's now retired. Oh. But my son-in-law and my daughter are very, very kind. He keeps his eye open for his mother's stuff that comes up at auction or eBay and buys <laughs> me. Um, they are, without question, the most beautiful bow ties I own. Wow, wow. And, and, and that being said, let's segue a little bit to the incredible Botstein family, which is like unbelievable. Uh, I mean, your wife is at the Whitney Museum. She's a curator over there. Uh, your daughter works for Ken Burns. Uh, you have a brother who's a biologist. I was just thinking, boy, if I ever had to sit at that table, I, I would be terrified to open my mouth. You know, I would say, I would say, pass the salt. That was all. That's all I would say. Well, you're, 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 <laughs> you're very much on the money so <laughs> to put it as succinctly as possible yes i have a wonderful eldest daughter who has been a long time producer at ken burns and um uh, florentine films and i think um and she's actually working now on several films that are will be coming out and um uh, she was uh, one of the lead producers in the big series on the vietnam war that they did several years back and um, I, I have two other children uh, who are terrific, and uh, one works for the mayor of Washington in Washington, D.C., and the other one is uh, finishing a Ph.D. And uh, my brother, older brother, is a very, very distinguished, uh, very significant molecular biologist and geneticist. He was the oldest. And I have a sister, wonderful sister, who's a pediatric cardiologist. And I had very distinguished grandparents. And, um, but you're right, when we came to this country, I was a, the youngest, and I was a child, a small child. And um, in my household, um, since I was the youngest, um, it was, um, yes, if you could get bass past the salt out, you were lucky. <laughs> <laughs> and I stuttered. I therefore stuttered all my childhood and adulthood, early adulthood. And I stuttered because it was terrifying. Um, yes. The person who was nicest to me was my grandfather, who had gone to, was Russian and uh, Russian Jewish, had done, was a lawyer trained in Kazan, but done graduate work in philosophy and um, uh, social theory in Germany in 1905-06 during in the years when the Russian universities were closed because of the revolution of 1905. He was a very educated man. They couldn't get into the United States, survive the Second World War, survive ghetto and camp, but they could not get a visa to the United States. So they moved to Mexico City. Mm. And so I spent many summers in Mexico City living with them. He was actually very encouraging. And uh, even though I had to negotiate communicating in more than one language, I stuttered in every language. And um, that was a function of, yes, of the, in a way, extreme pressure of the household. Mm. Uh, both my parents were brilliant and accomplished, and my brother was completely brilliant. And uh, so, and I don't think tolerance for his somewhat slower, younger brother came naturally to him. And, uh, and, uh, and so it was a tough household. Yeah, it, I, I, it, I, it was for me. I have no complaints, really. But, but I do think that, um, that my inability to speak uh, and without anxiety came from yeah, that environment. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Uh, I love the concept of the building's roman. You know, this idea of someone's intellectual biography and the story of one's educational development. Of course, Goethe uh, was famous for that uh, concept. You know, but let's think about uh, 
Can I call you Leon? Is that okay? Oh, please. All right, yeah, we so so formal, doctor. You know, but uh, and the progressive educators, you know, we always usually go by more first name <laughs> type thing. So, Leon, what um, in terms of your own story of intellectual development, who were some of the characters? Who, what were some of the major plot points and twists? And, you know, in terms of that, in your family, outside your family. Well, I think the most important part of the environment I grew up in was the way in which um, my parents and my grandparents uh, and the circle around them came to terms with the, the harsh but undeniable facts of the period around the Second World War. So we came to America because the Second World War and the Nazis successfully destroyed the culture and civilization of European Jewry. I mean, they killed six million Jews, leaving uh, a remnant of four or five million. So they killed more than 50%. In the town that my parents grew up in, there were 200,000 Jews. And in, 1940, in 1939, in 1945, my parents were two out of 10,000 surviving Jews from that city, which means the war effectively through extermination, uh, not through combat, uh, had killed 190,000 uh, of their fellow citizens in the city of Lodz, Poland. And um, <clears throat> so the most important environment for us was coming to terms with the questions that were a fallout of the war. And the most important question in my mind is not the recognition that we were victims, that we were Jews and therefore victims of the Nazis or victims of local anti-Semitism, Polish, Ukrainian, Russian, Hungarian, whatever it may have been. But what would we have done had we not been victims? In other words, framing the question. The reason the question was very important for us is because the one surviving brother of my mother, his wife was a righteous Gentile, was a Polish woman who sacrificed her life to rescue Jews during the war. And she was the only genuine heroine I ever knew. And the question we grew up is what would we have done? Let's say we lived in a side where we weren't the victims. And some police and military and secret police, some Gestapo, like in a Hollywood movie, comes not for you, but for your neighbor who isn't like you. Maybe the distinction is religious. Maybe it's race. Maybe it's height. Maybe it's eye color. Whatever the reason is, right? You're in, not in danger. You are actually part of, the um you you're not the 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 authorities that are cruel and have intent of harm are not after you they're after somebody else would you um resist would you um we have the problem now with many colleagues that we have um who were um who now are caught in russia because this is being taped, as you know, during the war between Russia and Ukraine. There's a war of aggression by Russia. And we, Bard, had the longest and most successful academic collaboration inside of Russia, which was closed down by Putin for being treasonous after 25 years mm. in St. Petersburg. So we have a lot of Russian colleagues who are professors, teachers, we had a liberal arts college inside the university, so we have alumni and we have artists. I've done a fair amount of conducting in Russia, I have musical colleagues, um, and uh, a lot of them are desperate to get out. Some can't get out, but if they speak out, they're going to go to prison for 15 years. Mm. And so how do you deal with um, your own obligation um, to fight for justice and for the right, you can't expect the people to be heroes. 
That's not, that's not right. You can't expect that doing the right thing, the minimum right thing, helping an old person across the street, right, something as simple as that, is criminalized. And you can go to jail for speaking your mind, for criticizing the government, things we take for granted. You can't consider a society just that, that penalizes it that way. But how do you resist a dictatorship, a totalitarian dictatorship? What does the ordinary citizen who's not important and has no power, is trying to make a living, you can't expect of them to be heroic. What you can expect them to do is not collaborate, right? I, you know, I respect the people who uh, take a path which we call inner emigra immigration, in in inner emigration, which means they withdraw from, they don't, they do their best not to facilitate all the bad stuff, right? Um, uh, you know, if someone, you know, doesn't betray hiding Jews, doesn't go to the police station and say, I know my neighbor has, you know, some extra people in, in their apartment, this kind of thing. Um, so I think the, in my own life, that ethical conversation, how do you behave well in a world in which radical evil becomes part of the fabric of our lives? Mm. I mean, Martin Luther King, Gandhi, how do you actually react if you want to live lawfully and you, the laws are wrong. The other pivotal influence for me was, of course, that music teachers who, um, who believe that um, I could make a go of it as a musician. Um, and um, teachers in university, the reason I work at Bard College and the word, reason that I am in the field of higher education, because it was in college that I first recognized that I could do something that was useful and do it well. Mm. And I owe my teachers, and my parents were very similar. In our home, their teachers' portraits hung on the wall. You know, we, we, hang, we hang portraits of, you know, our family, kids, you know, husband, wife, parents. But in, 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 my, in my parents' home, there were portraits hung of their teachers. And I have in my study of portraits of teachers of mine. And, and so I really was a beneficiary of great teaching. Mm. And that's helped, helped me formulate an ambition sort of to do the constructive work that was done with me. Um, with succeeding generations of students. Wow, wonderful. Um, I want to dwell a little bit, Leon, on your relationship with music, which is fascinating. You know, I happen to be a lover of music, uh, more popular music. You know, I grew up in the 70s with the great Motown. You no, know, music is music. Music is music. Music is music, right? Right. So wh where do you draw? I mean, did you did your love of classical music come into play? And then like your your friends were all listening to rock and roll and you said, no, I'm going to go listen to Beethoven. How did, how did that role of no, music? It's a, it's a good question. So I, yeah, you're, I, I grew up, uh, you know, I grew up in the age where um, I was, I'm old enough to remember when Elvis was a phenomenon, you know? Yes. And I'm old enough certainly to remember the Beatles and yeah. Rolling Stones and Motown, um, but, and, um, and Bob Dylan and the early days of Bob Dylan. Um, uh, my reaction to it was interesting. I, I, I never looked down on other forms of music but I was very clear in my own mind which music spoke to me. So for whatever reason, I can't explain it. Um, I, I didn't spend much time listening to other kinds of music. I was very preoccupied with, you know, music out of the classical tradition. Um, but in college, I lived for two years with a very prominent older jazz bassist who rented rooms out to students. And that was my gateway to having a um, 
so I discovered the uh, jazz traditions. Um, and but um, I think most of us who are professional musicians, um, you know, tip our proverbial hat to all musicians who do what they do well. I'll never forget. So they they had a failed renovation which they had to over, do over of Carnegie Hall in the late eighties. And um, a bunch of musicians, we got tickets to, complimentary tickets to the opening night, which was a gala night. I think Yo-Yo Ma played and Zubin made on the New York Philharmonic played. I don't remember everything about it, but I remember two things about it. There were two cameo appearances that weren't advertised. The place at Carnegie Hall was filled. They had just renovated the auditorium and the stage. And um, the two cameo appearances were Frank Sinatra ah. <laughs> and, and, um, and uh, Vladimir Horowitz, the pianist. And, you know, I'd never heard Horowitz live, and he was evidently senile. You know, he had this sort of senile grin. It was about maybe months or maybe a year before he died. And, um, but like many people with, you know, dementia of various kinds, isn't symmetrical. So, so he was so he looked disoriented on the stage, waving childishly to the audience. But he then found his way to the piano and he played. It was astonishing, you know, astonishing. This guy in his 80s, it was just, it just you know, he was a fat, great, great pianist. And it was just mind boggling. And then Frank Sinatra, elderly Frank Sinatra. And I've never seen a performer magnetically communicate with an audience. Hmm. It, this wasn't a young crooner, this was right. an opera film. And it was, you know, it was never music that interested me particularly, but you could not, it was jaw-droppingly good, you know, <laughs> um, in, 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 in his timing and the expressiveness of it. And so, you know, we didn't grow up. I didn't grow up. There are a lot of the people who are classical music snobs are rarely professionals. Mm. You know, the snobs you see coming out of a concert hall, they're not professionals. They're, they're I don't know. And it's, it's slightly annoying. Uh, and, um, but so I don't think, um, you know, I'm a real believer that music is music. And, um, it's great to see, for example, in a lot of contemporary music, the boundaries dissolve, you know, between various genres of music. Yeah, you know, it. Um, my mom is a great dancer. She basically, you know, taught me to dance. Listening to WABC radio as a kid growing up, all those great songs that would play, you know. Um, and uh, also, I think I may have discovered a link between democracy and music. Definitely it is. Definitely is. Yeah. This Alfred Schutz, Alfred Schutz, who was a great philosopher, who said something about how he sees making music together as a metaphor for human communication Absolutely. in a democratic society. Now, how does that sound? It's very important. It's Martin Luther understood this. Mm. So Protestantism uh, in Luther, not in Calvin, but Luther, uh, he understood. And then one of the successors in German Protestantism, Schleiermacher, believed that music was a medium of creating the body faithful. Oh. So they, it was clearly, a, and you know in the Bible, the musicians are come after the priests. So you're right. It, it has to do with the biblical myth in the Western tradition of why did God choose Moses, who had a speech impediment, to be his messenger hmm. to Pharaoh, right? Um, and there's a lot of commentary on this question. One of the commentary directions is, you want to underscore that speech is not necessarily the privileged communication with the divine. Music may be. Uh. And in many religions, music does have that function, music and dance. Wow. And so this philosophical thing that you 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 cite is is 
stands in a very long and, and, and honorable tradition of thinking about that question. Mm, mm. And, and I do think, um, I recently conducted a performance with um, students, graduate students and uh, undergraduates here of, of the German Requiem of Johannes Brahms. And um, so Brahms chose passages, uh, liturgical passages, which in German and set them to music. Um, and what bounces out of the page to you is exactly what you said, that this was written, you know, in the 1860s for amateur choruses, right? So it's music written for citizens who went for choral practice at their church or in a club you know, three times a week you know, or twice a week and gave concerts, you know, three or four times a year to their fellow citizens. Absolutely. Collective music making, mm. the act of playing and listening mm. are public events which create, uh, define the character of, a, of the public space. Mm. Mm. You know, two quick anecdotes. Uh, with, um, uh, the, there was a film, a documentary film about Ingmar Bergman called uh -huh. Bergman, Bergman's Island. And they said toward the end of his life, he would just miss, listen to music a lot. And he said that he felt that music was proof of the existence of God, according to Ingmar Bergman. And, and not, he, the, only one. not yeah. the only one. He, and E.L. Doctorow said something very similar in his novel, A City of God. But just to throw another quick story, my grandfather, who was half German, half Italian, who never went to college, he was a self-made man, actually made money in real estate, you know, did well for himself. But every Tuesday night, he would get dressed up and go to the Teaneck, New Jersey Choir. And, and that was his life. And he always used to say, like, culture. That was a very magical word with my grandfather, you know. You got to go to college because you got to get culture, right? Get culture. And I could still picture my grandfather singing. He did two solos. He did Some Enchanted Evening. Great. And he, did, and he did If I Love You, the bench scene from Carousel, and that will never leave me, the memory of my grandfather doing those two solos. Yeah. Well, the, the thing about music is that um, as a participatory thing, which is where it has its power, it does create a playing field that is more equally shared, you know, uh, than some other playing fields, um, whether it's sports, whether it is theater where you have to have a certain kind of accent and language it's it, it creates more of a a wider a more diverse human community i remember taking my daughter um uh i i i, I mentioned i was the music director of the radio orchestra of israel and the jerusalem symphony and i was traveling with my eldest daughter to a concert i was giving on her vacation and we stopped over in Zurich, where I was born, and um, on our way to Israel, and I, I, we looked, you know, we arrived sometime in the morning, and we looked at leaving the next day, and we discovered there was a concert in the main concert hall in Zurich uh, of, of the Mozart Requiem Mass, which is, you know, featured in the film Amadeus, which was very popular, you know, mm. some years back. and. Um, so I, we decided to go just on a lark, see whether we could get seats. And sure enough, the place was packed, we got seats. And it was turned out to be a free concert. And we took our seat, we didn't know. And a small professional orchestra was on stage. And the chorus was gigantic. Hmm. 300 people. And when you looked at the chorus, you suddenly discovered it was a chorus, an all Swiss chorus, but it's of amateurs, but its principle was it was inclusive. You had people on wheelchairs, in wheelchairs. Oh you had old people, disabled people, children and adults. It, it was so moving. I've never heard such a moving performance of this Mozart Requiem. They sang most of them by memory. And, 
and the place was packed. And you, when you looked around, you realized it was mostly, mostly relatives, but still, you know, a people mm. community. It was so beautifully done. Mm. And you saw how people not in wheelchairs were helping the people who were in wheelchairs. That you had obviously um, uh, children with real disabilities on that stage, and very many older people being helped by younger people singing. And you realize, yes, their music does provide a very necessary common ground. Music can also be used for propaganda. Music mm -hmm. can also be used cruelly. Uh, music can also, uh, music is used in war. I mean, you know, banging drums and bagpipes to mm -hmm. strengthen, you know, people to fight. Um, music is not, is not, you know, it's not, um, but it is, it's a different form of life. It isn't quite like talking and it isn't like quite, you know, playing baseball and it isn't quite, um, it, it, it has, uh, it has, I think, a very important and salutary role in making us understand that each of us is, in the end of the day, yes, we are equal because we all share the vulnerability and the character of being human. Mm. Leon, what's wonderful about you is uh, as an educational leader, and now myself, I'm in a doctoral program in educational leadership at Drexel. Uh, and, uh, you know, to have someone like place, you... A very good place, very good place. Oh, okay, all right. My colleagues will love that. They'll love that. Um, I've taught as an adjunct professor of English at various colleges. I've taught at Rutgers, Montclair State, CUNY, right, Stevens University. I do the adjunct shuffle because we're so low paid. You know, we teach here, we teach there. There was one college I taught at that will go nameless. I'm not going to embarrass them, okay? Right. But I heard the president giving a talk and I'm telling you, he sounded like a CEO. He did not sound like a, a leader of a moral enterprise. Everything out of his mouth was about competition, how we're going to defeat the other colleges, and we're going to see them in the rearview mirror because we, we're better than them, and our numbers are getting up. And our, It was horrible. It was horrible. So to have an educational leader like you who talks so movingly about a work of art, that's becoming increasingly rare. And I, I would like to see it less rare. And so with that being said, is it possible to get you out on the bigger shows? Is that something, I mean, what's your relationship with MSNBC? Have you been called it? So, so I, I, let, me, let me go back to the first point yes. you made. You know, being a college president um, is, has changed over time. And yeah. I've been doing it for a long time. And so, uh, I, I understand why what you experience is what you experience because the pressures on the people running these jobs is overwhelmingly um, a result of having to struggle with the uh, irrational way we finance higher education. Right? Mm. So the government doesn't really subsidize it as it should. We pass on the cost to the consumer in our state institutions, which is wrong. We pass on too much of the cost to our um, even in the private institutions. The truth is education, higher education particularly, is an investment in the economy. It's not a giveaway program. It's not a unemployment benefits program. It's not a um, uh, disincentive to work. It's actually an investment. It's like giving a developer a tax break. You know, it, it creates employment, it creates uh, jobs. It's, it's a net positive. Um, but we don't understand that. So we we create impossible situations for the people who lead these institutions. And um, uh, we, we, uh, we don't necessarily want them um, except for their practical purposes. As to, the as to the issue of the media. So there was a time in which I, um, I was pretty frequently on television, you know, and and it'll date me. So it was the period between uh, Johnny Carson, Dick Cavett, Ted Koppel mm. on the one hand and Stephen Colbert on the other. So I did a couple of appearances when he had his own show. But since then, no. Um, mm. uh, I, I, you know, I've never, never been... Um, 
my sort of uh, TV exposure mm. uh, was, it's by any reasonable, mm. been very, very extensive. I was on Oprah, you know. Oh. Uh, that's, <laughs> yeah, that's wow. the uh, whole, you know. That's, <laughs> Wow. <laughs> That's the top of the high. You can't get higher than that. You can't get yeah. higher than that, Leon. And it's because of her that all these barred high school early colleges exist because she wow. devoted an entire program to the idea and uh, wow. of early college. So, um, uh, but I would say in the last decade or more, um, particularly since 2001, since 9 11, mm. um, I would say the public media has devoted less time or interest uh, to educational issues. They've right. they've sort of drifted. Uh, we were lucky. Um, the first Bard High School, public Bard High School, early college, was in in Manhattan, in Wash, in New York, and at the end of the Giuliani administration under Harold Levy, the then chancellor, and the decision and the maid was made in March 2001. If they had delayed, the thing would have been killed mm. had a discussion of it begun after 9-11. Mm, mm, mm. We got on the train on the last car, if you know what I mean. You know, as we winding up, it feels like we're just beginning here. But also, I want to just give the origin of why we're even having this dialogue. And it all has to do with my wife, Claudia, who, oh, watched, who watched a Zoom session with you talking about George Soros a month ago at CUNY. At, oh, yeah. at, CUNY, at CUNY. So she said, I want to watch this. You know, was, who else was Paul Krugman was in that too? <laughs> I don't know. But anyway, but that was right. So let's give a shout out to George, you know, yeah, sort of, and, and if we could maybe get him interested in financing like a whole new humanistic educational apparatus that would include a media. It would have to include a media, Leon, also. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yes. I think but he has made a commitment to fund um, at a billion dollars a new um, institution, if you will, called the Open Society University Network. Ooh, okay. and I'm the chancellor of it, so I'm I'm oh. I'm charged with designing it, oh. and um, uh, yes, he's been very generous uh, oh. in this regard, and he does believe that education is crucial to the future of democracy. Fantastic. Well, you know, he's Hungarian. I'm part Hungarian. Let's uh, let's get this European tradition thing and and keep alive that spirit of the best of the past. And, and the innovation, and, 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 you know, we're looking forward to keeping this, I hope this is just the beginning. Oh, yeah, listen, anytime you want to have a conversation, whether you tape it or not, I'm yes. game. We'd love to come. Oh, thank you so much, Leon. Anyway. Oh, yeah, my pleasure. Listen, I'm grateful for the, the okay. attention, you know? Yes. Oh, you've been wonderful. This is a, a favor. You know? A dream of mine for many years to have a conversation with Leon Botstein. Uh, thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Best to you. God and best to Claudia. Good luck, and of course, especially to Claudia. Say hi to Claudia. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Lasky. Take care. Okay, bye-bye. Okay, bye -bye. see you later. Thank Take you. care. Bye-bye. <laughs>